I'm going to call this meeting of the New Hanover County Board of Education to order. If everyone would please stand for the invocation. Before I begin the invocation, I'm going to ask if everyone would observe a moment of silence. New Hanover County lost one of its uh, most preeminent principals today. James McAdams passed away. So I'm going to ask if everyone would join me in a moment of silence for him. Gracious God, grantor of all loving and gifts, be with this board as we meet to work for the good of the children in this district. Be with our teachers, staff, and the parents who all work to make education available to them. We pray for all our leaders, whether federal, state, or local. Help them to make wise decisions we pray for all those serving in the military, whether on abroad or on this side. Watch over them and protect them until they can return to their families. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, All right, uh, everybody may be seated. <coughs> All right, um, the national anthem was brought to us by the Hanover Singers from New Hanover High School, and I think you have a microphone if you would. Yes, my name is Whitney Lanier, and I'm the director of the Hanover Singers. And if they would tell us their grade also, please. <laughs> My name is Nicholas Marshall, and I'm a senior. My name is Harper Williams, and I'm a senior. My name is Jonathan Carr, and I'm a senior. My name is Ariana Shinette, and I'm a senior. My name is Jordan Milkarski, and I'm a senior. My name is Jasmine Kinsey, and I'm a senior. My name is Christina Ayala, and I'm a senior. My name is Elena Elligood, and I'm a senior. Um, my name is Abigail Hawkins, and I'm a senior. 
And my name is Lindsey Crandall, and I'm also a senior. And if you'd pass it down to <coughs> the color guards. My name is Chase, I'm a senior. And Frank. My name is Ben, and I'm also a senior. Okay, and you're from Ashley High School. <coughs> <coughs> Color guard, as I said, was from Ashley High School. Principal Patrick McCarty is here, and the instructors are Chief Thomas Frost and Lieutenant Colonel Robert Reeder. So I want to thank y'all for coming and being with us today. Ms. Adams, would you call the roll? Edward Keith Higgins. Here. Jeanette Adams. <coughs> here. Dennis A. Cadillac. Here. Here. You have before you the agenda. Are there any uh, amendments or changes? Move that we approve the agenda. So I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It is approved. Approval of, of the minutes of December 5th, the regular meeting, and the December 19th, the regular meeting. Uh, do I hear a motion that we approve those minutes? I move that we approve both sets of minutes. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> it is approved. Next item, recognition of achievement. Uh, Ms. Quarterbone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone, and we're so glad to have you here tonight. We will begin our recognitions with uh, a community partnership presentation <coughs> by our friends from Kids Making It. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you Jimmy Pierce, the founder and executive director of Kids Making It, and he will share with us how his organization benefits our students and at-risk youth across the district through its woodworking and mentoring program. Jimmy, good to see you. Yes, same. Thank you all so much, uh, Chairman Higgins, uh, Dr. Markley, board members. It's an honor to be here. Um, I have had the pleasure over the last, um, going on 20 years now, working with students from New Hanover High School. <clears throat> Although we are open to serving kids from all around, 99 plus, plus, plus percent of our kids have always been New Hanover County High School school kids uh, from middle school, elementary school, all the way up through graduation. We served over 4,500 kids since 2000 when I started doing this full time. And we've grown from a program um, serving primarily young kids and uh, and, and an after-school program one day a week uh, to having five programs. And what we've learned over the years is the more we can, uh, you know, we have a mission, and, and the mission is one thing, but the, and, and that matters. And it has to do with preventing juvenile delinquency and helping kids go on, stay on the right path and all of that. But when I tell people what we do, what I like to say is our whole goal is to make sure kids stay in school make sure they stay out of trouble, make sure they graduate from high school and go on to a successful adulthood through jobs or college. And if they do those things, we feel like we've succeeded. And I'll tell you, uh, through our, our work and our partnership with the school system and the teachers and, and everyone, uh, we've managed to have a 100% graduation rate uh, for forever. Uh, uh, thank you. We, 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 we I, 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 I will say that we had one young woman uh, about eight years ago who had the misfortune of becoming pregnant in her senior year at New Hanover, and she had to step out of school to have that baby, and so she did not graduate. Then uh, she later went on to, but, uh, but uh, I will mention some of our partnerships, and then I want to tell you about our programs and talk about our kids, but I have a list here, and it starts with, um, and it's in no particular order, but, uh, you know, people that we have connected with over the years that we work with on a regular basis. It involves Judy Stubblefield, uh, bullying prevention coordinator. Certainly involves Valida Qualabom, who has helped us a lot, had her on uh, her show. Um, 
you know, the, uh, the social workers and the guidance counselors uh, have all come into our space. We make presentations to them. We work with them for uh, referrals to our program. Um, the school resource officers uh, made a presentation uh, earlier last year to all of them because we, they are on the front lines along with the teachers and the guidance counselors and the social workers for kids who, who could stand a little extra help. Uh, certainly Dr. Markley, appreciate your support. Uh, very nice blog post you put out about us a while back. Um, and, um, you know, Glenn Locklear and J.C. Rowe, uh, we're doing some work with those kids over there. And most recently, um, Duke Wallen and Edith Skipper at CTEC. Um, let me tell you about our programs, and I think you'll understand a little more about how we, we interconnect on a daily basis with, with the New Hanover County school system and the kids. Um, we serve four to 500 kids per year ranging from age seven all the way through uh, post-graduation, frankly. Um, we serve younger kids in introductory woodworking classes where we bring them into our shop or we go to their place. We go into the schools and do these sometimes too where we let them uh, learn some woodworking and build a project to keep for themselves. When they get to be 13, we offer them the opportunity to come into our shop on Castle Street where we uh, have a very complete uh, woodworking shop, much like we had, uh, I say we, I'm talking to uh, many people in my generation here. Um, some of you are a bit younger, but we, we had, when, when I was in school, we had shop classes. Well, we have those tools in our shop, and we teach kids to use those tools. We combine it with an entrepreneurial piece. Um, some of you may know this already, but we give them the opportunity to sell what they make if they want to in our retail shop. And I will tell you that we very proudly wrote over $3,600 in checks in December for the previous month to some 35 to 40 New Hanover County school kids for the work they had done and the <coughs> products that they sold. We found that connecting work to income with these kids makes, I, I say these kids, all of our kids, I'm, I'm talking about the kids we worked with, but it makes a huge difference to realize, you know, what you put in is what you can get out. Um, so, so that's a long-term uh, program, and, and those, the kids that we have in that program can come uh, all throughout their school years and beyond. Uh, for kids who graduate or otherwise are out of school and need a job and can't get a job, we offer them jobs in our apprenticeship program. We have a line of um, custom-made uh, ornaments and jewelry that we do on our legion grave. We put in gift shops around the state. We do custom work for the county. Uh, for agencies here in town, for the, um, for the airport authority. We, we have some production machinery and we employ these older kids to do that work. We give them jobs and paychecks and help use that as a stepping stone to help them move into the, into the workforce <coughs> full time. A couple of years ago I got a call from the city saying that they want to start the summer jobs program to put kids in jobs but they want us to run it. So we started that first year and uh, hired 14 kids from right over here in Hillcrest and Houston more primarily to, uh, to get their first job ever and build raised garden beds for the public housing communities. We've since uh, done that in partnership with the Blue Ribbon Commission and every summer we put 35 to 40 kids in jobs. Um, and our latest program, and I know I've got a PowerPoint, I'll <laughs> zip through that in just a second, but our latest program is, and our newest one is our skilled trades program. <coughs> We've noticed that often when uh, the kids, particularly the guys, get to be 16, 17, they've got maybe another year or so in school, uh, sometimes they kind of drift away. And we've realized they're probably surrounded by a bunch of 13, 14, and 15 year olds and they figure they are too cool for this. Well, that's the wrong time for us to lose them. And I will proudly tell you, despite our graduation rate, as you know, not all of our kids are gonna go to college. And for those who aren't, we want to help them um, have a good pathway into a, a lifetime of meaningful work. And in this town, there's a lot of opportunity and good money to be made in the construction industry. Um, for every new person entering the skilled construction trades, five leave uh, every, every day, every year. Um, so we are starting a program, uh, and I, I will tell you, I had a, have had some great conversations and visits, and <coughs> a visit recently with Duke Wallen and Edith Skipper at SeaTech. At I am so proud of what you all are doing with that school. 
it needs to be in every school system in the country. Uh, it's, it's exciting what, what y'all are doing with that. I'm excited about what they're doing, and we're going to be partnering with them to provide some hands-on experience in our shops, and, and we want to work with them and offer jobs in our summer jobs program because uh, we can put kids in jobs. And so we will be teaching all the skilled construction trades uh, in our new program, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, construction, carpentry, masonry, and we're building an addition onto our shop to do it. Um, we have just about raised all the money we need. We need a little bit more, but we're building a 4,200 square foot shop next to our building to do that. We have, we'll be able to put kids in jobs with paid, uh, paid positions. So I, I could go on and on, I won't. Um, I'm probably at my, I'm at my 10 minute mark, Ms. Quattlebaum. <laughs> I'm getting there. Well, I'll breeze through it real quick, uh, just to show you some photos. Did I, did I lose my thing here? I didn't turn it on. I need I need I need help with everything that's related to. I should have brought one of my kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't believe I can figure this out. You showed me. What am I doing wrong? Oh, it's, it's did. It does work. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Just to give you a couple of visuals, this is our shop and some of the products that our kids make. A retail shop, rather. Uh, this is our woodworking shop, and in fact, I think we may have the uh, privilege of hosting the principals' meeting there come the spring. Am I right, Dr. Markley? I think we're, we're talking about that. We're trying to get one of our meetings over to your yeah, place. that'd be great. We'd lo love to have you. We'll push all the workshop benches away and, and bring you in here. Uh, some of our kids with some of their projects, um, more kids, more projects, all New Hanover County kids. This is a, a picture we like a lot, our kids with their paychecks. Uh, they love to get those checks. They ask us every month, are the checks ready yet? Uh, and I'm telling you, I have had more than one kid answer their cell phone, even though they know that phone's not supposed to be on, and I've heard them say, I can't talk now, I'm at my job. And when a 13-year-old says that, something's working. Um, this is our apprenticeship program, not a great photo, but just a little facility we have in the back there. Some of our production equipment, that's our computer numerically controlled router. We're getting ready to do an eight or 10 foot sign for Birch Creek Apartments on that. Um, and our, our kids will be doing it. Our laser engraver, um, some of the stuff we do with our laser engraver. This is our building that we're in now. This is how it's gonna look when we build our skilled trades facility. That two story on the right is our addition. Um, another little angle of that. What have I got now? Awards, we don't need that. Uh, all these kids here, proud New Hanover High School kids, and I can tell you the stories behind all of them, but I, I won't. I will tell you that the young woman on the right there uh, came out of turnkey. She's now probably 30 years old. She was in Kids Making It. Uh, went to New Hanover High School, and she called me uh, a couple of years ago and said, I wound up at uh, Le Cordon Bleu, and I'm a chef down in Atlanta, and everything uh, you all did help me. I want to start a program down here working with kids, teaching them how to cook and bake. Help me do it. So I said, I'm your guy, I will. And I will tell you briefly, Austin Wilson, one of our most recent, most proud uh, st students that we're all proud of, um, New Hanover High School graduate, uh, now on the cast of this old house television show. Um, he's down in Orlando this week representing them at the National Home Builders Trade Show. But I will tell you, it takes everybody in this room to help our kids to succeed and everybody beyond this room too so i want to thank you for everything you do every opportunity you've given us and every help you've given us over the years um thank you very much and on behalf of the board i want to thank you for everything you have done i have known you from i guess probably 20 25 years yeah. however long when we you've first been came here. to town you're one of the first people i met <laughs> but thank you for all you've done Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Pierce. And now I have the exciting privilege to recognize our great New Hanover High School Wildcats, <laughs> who are the Division Three AA Football State Champions.
from 60 to 100. So while Mr. Higgins gets ready, I want you to know the Wildcats defeated Asheville's AC Reynolds High School in a nail biter with a final score of 27 to 17. And at this time, we'll ask Mr. Higgins if he will present the special award to Coach Earl Smith, the assistant coaches, and all of the students of our state champion Wildcats football team. Congratulations, Wildcats. Ms. Quadabom, if you take a picture, can we get our board members to go out and? Yes, thank you. Sam? Yes, you want to take a picture? <clears throat> if Dr. Rob Morgan, Principal Morgan, is here, would you please come forward? Is he there? Okay, great. Our next recognition is for our Board of Education. For those of you who might not know, January <laughs> is School Board Appreciation Month, and so we want to take a minute to pause and thank our board members for the service that they do to the community, for our students, for our staff, and they put in countless hours, and they receive a lot of input, good and bad, from the community, so we want to thank them for what they do. If the board members would look at your, at your station, there is a 10 cookie box. And Who this is, these cookies? well, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a special gift that we collaborated with students from Hoggard and Ashley High Schools, and the students and teachers in the CTE programs created this for you. If you look inside your box, you'll see a special cookie cutter. The engineering classes designed that cookie cutter. It's an NHCS yes. cookie cutter, oh. so you can make more cookies and think of us. Did, did the students know they were for the board? Yes. <laughs> we'll pass them out to the audience right. first. <laughs> uh, Imer, uh, you want to come taste it? <laughs> so Mary Hazel won't let us spend money on you, so we thought this was a nice way. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Oh, good. I'm glad you like them. And we wanted to um, recognize the teachers who helped us put this project together. So if you he are here, would you please stand? Miss Blair, Dean, Mr. Stephen O'Neill, Miss Dana Wolf, and Mr. Darrell Rogers. <laughs> and we also have a student. Jake Japina, who designed the NHCS cookie cutter that each of you have received. <laughs> what a certificate for Jake. Thanks, Jake. You're one sweet cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I just come up with this. Couldn't help it. Just couldn't help. I couldn't help myself. 
and our next award, Dr. Murphy likes the name of this one, it goes to our child nutrition department for their work with our summer food service program, and it's called the Turn Up the Beat Award. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Ivor Smith to come up. <laughs> and they, this is for our summer meal program and the high quality meals that our children get during the summer months. <laughs> And this helps our children not have food insecurity over the summer. And also, I'm and her department are eligible for a national award with the USDA. So go child nutrition. <laughs> Next, we'll recognize our middle school and high school honors chorus participants. Each of our students went through a rigorous audition before being selected to become a part of these prestigious choruses. Students, as I call your name, would you please come up for a group photo with Mr. Higgins? I'll start with the participants from the Middle School's Honors Chorus from Myrtle Grove Middle School. Michael Cook. Ella Shinette. <laughs> and Cole Donner. <laughs> Their chorus teacher is Ms. Caitlin Baden. And if Principal Cindy Blitz is here, would you come up for a group picture? Okay, if not, we'll take the picture with Mr. Higgins and the students. There's Blitz. <laughs> There's Principal Blitz. Thank you, Middle School Chorus. <laughs> Next. We will recognize the High School Honors Chorus. Students, as I call your name, please come forward. From Hogger, Kellen Hansen. <laughs> Sonia Shaw could not be here tonight. Parker Tanner. And Fletcher Williams. <laughs> the Chorus Director at Hoggard is Benjamin Harrell. From New Hanover High School, Jordan Milkarski. <laughs> New Hanover is showing off tonight. <laughs> Abigail Hawkins. And Lily Hawkins. <laughs> and their chorus teacher is Whitney Lanier, who we met earlier. Congratulations, high school chorus. <laughs> Next, we will recognize one student who made the honors orchestra. And this is the only student in New Hanover County Schools <coughs> who made this recognition. I would like to invite Dakota Marshall from Laney High School to please come forward. I guess he's not here, but he um, was, rec we're recognizing him for his selection to the North Carolina Honors Orchestra, and we'll make sure he gets his recognition. And finally this evening, we will recognize a group of students who represented the district as one of the top 16 plays in the North Carolina Theater Conference State 
Play Festival. They won awards for excellence in acting, excellence in projection and articulation, and the Festival Spirit Award. The State Play Festival showcases the talent of more than 3,000 students from over 100 schools and nearly 130 productions. And we're so proud of the way these students represent the arts education program here in New Hanover County Schools. As I call your name, would you please come forward for a group photo? From Hoggart High School, Casey Burton. Excellence in acting and excellence in projection and articulation. Matthew. Athena Brenner, Excellence in Projection and Articulation. <laughs> Amelia Loudermilk, Excellence in Projection and Articulation. <laughs> Sage Colstead, Excellence in Projection and Articulation. And finally, Sophie Rocco, Excellence in Projection and Articulation. <laughs> Thank you for representing the group. <laughs> okay. Um, the next group of students, as well as the members of the drama team, are also earned the Festival Spirit Award and we will ask you to come forward, please, if you're here. Mackenzie Boone, Lola Byers Ogle, Lena Dello, Alan Griffin, D'Amico Mahatha, <laughs> D'Amico, I'm glad you showed up. <laughs> Emily Sappho, Ray Starling, Orion Strickland, and Aiden Van Natten. <laughs> These students are led by Hoggart's theater instructor, Allie Collins. Thank you for your excellent work in the theater. Thank you for your attention. Next item on our agenda is the call to the audience. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. However, time does not permit dialogue between the board and the community. While the board welcomes residents to share their views, the chairman retains the right to limit discussion on a particular topic when such topic becomes slanderous or personal in nature. I've had two people to sign up. Anna Newkirk. I don't, I don't think she's here. Okay. Melissa Story. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am here on behalf of Isaac Bear Early College. I truly believe that they must have a new building. Could you pull the microphone up a little closer? Absolutely. The current structure is abysmal and does not properly house or support its talented teachers or administrators, let alone the repeatedly highest ranking students in the county. One glance will show you. Teachers forced to share classrooms, a modular building that is falling apart, if not posing a fire hazard, bathroom stalls being used as storage, and students eating outside in inclement weather because the lunchroom is minuscule leaving well over half the student population without proper facilities on a daily basis. 
not to mention the innovation, integrity, and excellence that is glaringly absent, which students of this caliber crave and deserve. This is unacceptable. Besides being structurally inadequate, insufficient, and inappropriate, the location is entirely insecure. With an apartment building looming over it on one side and a sprawling abandoned retail space behind, the site is wide open for someone with malevolent intentions, not to mention the 156 registered sex offenders within a five mile <coughs> radius, 10 within one mile of the school. There was a well-publicized attempted ab abduction of a UNCW student during school hours, not even three months ago, not one mile from Isaac Bear. That could have easily been my 14-year-old daughter. I have never once seen either a UNCW campus police officer or a Wilmington Police Department officer on the premises who are notably present on any other New Hanover County School campus post Sandy Hook. Not even a patrol car. This school needs to be rebuilt on the campus proper with all the appropriate security measures afforded. UNCW certainly has the land. Isaac Bear Early College High School should not be literally and figuratively left on the outskirts, ignored, overlooked, and forgotten, except when the school's phenomenal test scores somehow serve those in power. Finally, with only the vaguest of crosswalks at McMillan and Hamilton as you enter the university, I am shocked that there has not been a fatal accident of either a UNCW or an Isaac Bear student. I plea with the Board of Education tonight that you will use all the power that you have to advocate for a new building for Isaac Bear. We need to keep up with these students. They are certainly earning a new building. They deserve a it, not even, it doesn't have to be a showy building, just a proper building where we can house all of the students, all of the teachers properly. I appreciate this audience tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next item, administrative personnel? None. Okay. Next item, head start. Mr. Sherrill. We have three items for us tonight. Um, we have our liaison report, which you're familiar with. Um, some of the highlights or updates there are at the bottom of that page. But for the audience, I'll say 113 students were seen by the dental mobile unit from the health department. Out of these. Uh, students 12 were returning and 62 were new patients. The dental mobile unit did a total of 250 sealants, 114 restorations, and 10 crowns. These are three and four year olds. Mental health consultant met with each classroom teaching team and the principal to initiate strategies to support students with behavioral concerns and leadership Wilmington reps visited the site to learn about the impact of Head Start and early learning in our community. And for the audience benefit, Head Start is a program that uh, New Hanover County Schools took on. This is our fifth year uh, and have done very well. Um, uh, particularly with Ms. Uh, Smiles leadership and um, something to be proud of, but it is an undertaking um, of uh, ch children that in, in many cases are challenged. And we, uh, we not only try to educate and prepare them for uh, school, but we also look after their health and mental health needs, which is part of their ability to learn. The second item I have for you tonight is the expenditure report, which you're 
familiar with um, the New Hanover County Schools Head Start program is a federally funded <coughs> program so it's federal money uh, we receive uh, a grant uh, from the federal government <coughs> and it's uh, our budget is just short of two million dollars and uh, in and pays for the programs that uh, are run for these three and four year old children. Uh, out of the 260 children that are in the uh, the program, um, 95 are three year olds, 165 are four year olds. And then the third item we have, well, let me just say, as far as the expenditure report, we're on uh, budget, we're seven months through our fiscal year and that would uh, and we're slightly under budget for that period of time uh, so the funds are being well managed unless there are questions I'll move on the uh, third item uh, which is a critical item will, will require a vote tonight is um, the renewal of our continuation grant we're in the fifth year of that grant it is non-competing because of the excellent job that and scores that this uh, program has received uh, under the school supervision. And the grant would be for the same amount of a million nine hundred seventy-seven thousand six hundred ninety-seven dollars. The grant package, which you have, uh, if you have questions, I'll, I'll, yield, I'll yield to our expert. Uh, Ms. Smiles, but it includes the goals and the strategic objectives of the organization. So it's it's um, it's a lengthy read, but it's um, uh, very uh, insightful in what it provides and what we are trying to accomplish. Mr. Shaw, um, what does what does non-competing mean? Sorry. Non-competing. Non-competing means that. Uh, because of the job that they've done uh, and gotten high scores during that five-year period is somewhat of a guarantee that New Hanover County would continue to be funded. Thank you for the question. Ms. Miles, would you like to add uh, to that? Thank you, Mr. Shell. Um, that sums it up. Um, we are a non-competing grant competing grant um, um, due to the fact that we've had um, um, excellent scores with all of our Head Start reviews that have come around. <coughs> so we are on our fourth year currently for 1718. <coughs> this is our uh, reflection for our fifth year for 1819. Then we start the process all over for 1920. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Do you need a motion that we I'll let, I'll let Michelle make the motion since he's reporting. Okay. As the liaison and a student of this program, I, I uh, make a motion that we accept this grant uh, to continue Head Start, c continuation Head Start for another year. I have I'll a second the motion. I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? I would just say in, in the seven years I've been here, we've started a lot of phenomenal programs. There's not one that I think that has had more of an impact on our students and quality of life than what we've done with our, our Head Start program. I do not disagree. And that is a credit to the folks who work in that program. Thank you. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is approved. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to believe it's been here. I know. Four years. <laughs> Well, thank you for the report, Mr. Shell. Yes. <coughs> All right. Next item on our agenda, information. Exemption from formal qualification-based selection for professional services, Appendix D, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as required by the general statutes, <coughs> each year we bring a report to the board of <coughs> all exemptions made to the formal qualification-based selection process. Uh, for professional services. These services include uh, architects, engineers, surveyors, and uh, construction managers at risk. 
Uh, the exemptions are only allowed or uh, permitted for services where the fees are estimated at 50000 or below. Uh, the attached list uh, includes all the exemptions made for 2017. Uh, they're attached for information only, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, where's the attachment? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I will say that all of these services uh, and these projects are, are pretty standard. Uh, all of these were, uh, were in the budget and approved by the board. Um, and looking over these, there's, there's nothing, that, uh, nothing that's out of the ordinary. Anybody have any questions about any of this? My only question is, why is that showing up on the screen in the rear? Nothing's showing up on the screen in the rear. It's not set up that way right now. It's showing up behind you. So people in the audience can see it. Any other questions? I would show them the back of the back. I did too. All right. Then we, it's for information only, right? Correct. That's correct. All right. Next item, change order report, Appendix E. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a report is also for information. It's uh, required by the general statute uh, that we bring you this report. Uh, periodically. This is a relatively new statute and it's the first time it's been presented to the board. Um, the report includes uh, for each project we've listed the contractor's name, the project name, the original contract <coughs> amount, the amount of all change orders uh, approved with a brief description of each and then the revised contract amount. Um, we added to our report a breakdown of responsibility, so I'll give you a little bit better idea of, um, you know, where or what generated the change order. Um, I will say that overall our change orders on our projects are very low. Um, they are 3% or less, which um, includes some pretty major renovations uh, such as uh, Hoggard and Laney. Uh, so uh, we have a, a very low change order percentage, um, and while we, all, we will continue to work to minimize change orders on our projects, um, I think the facility planning staff, architects, and engineers are to be commended for their efforts on these projects. Again, this item is uh, presented just for information, but uh, I would be happy to answer any specific questions that you may have. Uh, I do. Um, Mr. Anderson, when... Uh, you see, I, I guess what I'm looking <coughs> at uh, is the Porter's Neck Elementary School, and it was a 12.6, am I reading it right, $12.6 million project? Yes, sir. Okay, and you had um, a $161,000 change order at the owner's request. I guess that would be our request. Can you explain yes, sir. what that was? Um, well. Anytime there's an owner requested change, this would be something that uh, we requested during the course of the project that wasn't included in the original bid documents. Do you recall what that was for? Well, um, actually down below you'll see um, we change order number three. There were three items. Uh, we added an interference manhole, uh, probably to ease uh, maintenance. We upgraded uh, a door hardware uh, to our new new standards, and uh, we installed geo uh, fabric and riprap at the back ditch. Uh, these were things that were not included in the original bid, but a, a lot of times during construction, when you're out on the site on a weekly basis, you'll see things that uh, we could do then. And, uh, that are uh, less costly that will save us money in, uh, in maintenance in the long run. This, this amount, Mr. Anderson, this amount does not include land costs, correct? Just, just simply the construction? This is, this is only the general contractor's contract. Um, You're guess, correct. It does not include land. And they were bid out, what, four years, four years ago would have been? Four or five years ago? Yes, sir. Is that right? How, what have construction costs done since that time? 
uh, gone up significantly. Um, I didn't, I don't have the numbers off the, uh, but I would say when this was bid, we were probably in the $120 or, uh, a square foot range. Um, costs today for our most recent projects, <coughs> excuse me, are about 170. Um, average costs across the state for school construction is uh, just over $200 a square foot. So you, you're correct, in the past three years, construction costs have gone up significantly. Any further discussion? <coughs> All right, hearing <coughs> next item, increased bus driver employment pool appendix F. Dr. Wellmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I may ask Mr. Nance to come up and speak at the center mic if he wouldn't mind because he's a very important part of this presentation. Uh, the board may remember that two years ago we brought a presentation or, or a proposal to you to consider looking at uh, teacher assistants uh, who are hired in the following school years to be eligible to become school bus drivers. Since that time we have implemented a lot of the parts of the plan which are included in this such as trying to get other support staff involved as teacher assistants, looking at providing them support. Uh, looking at financial support and the testing support, everything that goes along with the somewhat burdensome uh, way that we have to go through the state and through the, the laws to get someone certified to drive a bus. Uh, if you happen to walk down the hall and pass Mr. Nance when it's on a bad day, he's liable to ask you exactly what your license is <laughs> and if, if you have anything that he can put you into a bus with because most days he's putting most of the administrators in his building in a bus and he is certainly using every sub and everyone else we have. From that time we were at a higher unemployment rate, we're at a lower rate now, which also means we're competing for jobs. Uh, Mr. Nance's bus positions are not even as, as well received as they used to, though we changed the, uh, the salaries to reflect a, a quicker way for bus drivers to get more money into the system and we've tried everything we do to support folks who want to go into it. We've even, and we've been somewhat successful in a small way. We've had a teacher become a bus driver. We have had some child nutrition folks get in, but we've not done it to the point we have. And unfortunately, Mr. Nance is losing drivers due to all sorts of different reasons. We're not able to attract the drivers that we'd like. And so we're looking at a fairly dire situation to get more bus drivers. Um, and so what we're looking at is a proposal uh, which you have before you, which once again would ask the teacher assistants who come in next year be eligible to be school bus drivers for us. We would continue to provide the other support for other uh, uh, staff members, support staff, so they can do it. Um, and we would look at trying to recruit within to get folks into buses. So we're doing everything we can to try to make that happen. Mr. Nance, is that a good summary of kind of where we are right now? Yeah, pretty much so. Our, our issue now is <clears throat> Uh, like Mr. Dr. Wilmer said, we can find people who want to be bus drivers. We can't find people who can meet the qualifications to be a bus driver. They can't pass the written test or the driving test or now get a DOT medical card or either they have something, some issue on their criminal background or their driving record. It's just really hard with unemployment being 4% to find people who want to be bus drivers. And that's what we face each and every day. If you go look at other counties, this is not a problem just here in New Hanover County. All over the United States, the num number one issue in school bus transportation is trying to find school bus drivers. There's just too many other things out there. And again, we can find people who want to be a bus driver, they just can't qualify to be a bus driver. And the testing has gotten harder than what it used to be. Starting this year, they got to have a DOT medical card. Up to December 31st, they just had to pass a normal physical, which is now you've eliminated certain people who may have diabetic, diabetes issues or may have high blood pressure issues. And some of those people that would have qualified last year will not qualify starting January 1st this year. So again, our concern is each and every day like yours is getting kids to school on time and not sitting on the side of the road. And every day, I can tell you, we have late buses because we don't have enough drivers. This, starting this day, we had 10, job, 10 driver vacancies and we have seven drivers out long term. So we had to cover 17 buses some way today and that'll be th that way tomorrow and the next day after that. So we're trying to look for some opportunities to find other qualified individuals to be school bus drivers. If you look at Bladen County, Cumberland County, Pender County, Brunswick County, they all use teacher's aides to drive school buses. And we're just looking at that as another opportunity for us to maybe find qualified candidates. 
May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Are we doing anything to assist possible drivers with the driving test? Are we giving any kind of tutorial courses or anything to help them get through the test? They go to class for three days prior to the test being given. The, the, they go to class uh, three straight days, we skip a day to give them a, a day to study if they need to, and then they take the, the test on the fourth day. What does it cost to take the, uh, sit for that test? Nothing. Are there any cost associated with becoming a driver? We'll either pay the cost or reimburse them for that. So if there's a medical exam, okay. we'll cover or reimburse those costs. So there, there's not a cost issue in terms of doing this. We've got a couple of issues. One is, a, is the pipeline is small because of uh, the current economic situation. The second pipeline through DOT is a very narrow pipeline to start with. Uh, and when we get to our legislative breakfast, that's one of the things I'm going to ask that we talk to our legislators about is a way to open that pipeline a little bit, maybe allow us to do some of the training and testing uh, or, or some other things. Mm -hmm. So you've got those two pipelines. And we're not asking in this proposal to tell somebody who's already a TA, you got to go drive a bus. But I would like us to consider making it a requirement, uh, a condition of employment for new teacher assistants coming on board. Well, long yeah. range, wouldn't the, <clears throat> like Charlotte Mecklenburg, wouldn't the, a simpler solution, something we could consider would be different start times for high school, middle school, and elementary schools. That way you'd, a smaller pool of drivers would be necessary to cover, they could do more runs if we had the, the Sta uh, staggering of the start times. I mean, is that something we've looked at? Uh, we, we, yes, sir, we've looked at it. Uh, we've, we actually got a proposal that I mean, that would solve the problem, wouldn't it? If it, we, it, it, would, it would help. I mean, yes. you are currently doing double runs with your, with, your, with your staff. They're doing an elementary run and then coming back and doing a middle and high school run. My question was what you just addressed. So apparently I must not have been clear in my question. We are giving courses and no, the State Department of Transportation does. State does that. Oh, so what do we do, though, in order to assist them in getting through the process? We don't. We, we don't do any kind of tutorial or anything to help? No, the state does that, okay? That's a state's responsibility to, to go through three days of training prior to taking I mean, we could certainly have additional class, but most people have trouble getting off for the three days to go to the tutorial for those three days. We've actually started offering classes at nighttime, too, for those who may have another job. But the state's responsibility right now is to provide that three-day tutorial prior to taking the test. And the people who do that are experts at, at what the test is all about and the questions that are on that test. How, how many TAs do we have driving now? How many TAs? TAs? I don't think we have any right this minute. So we don't have any driving? No. Um, so. I guess my next question is kind of twofold and based on that. One, is there a fear, and I understand we're saying we're not going to require it for current TAs, but is it a fear that we're going to lose TAs in the future because we're having this mandatory requirement? Uh, TAs across the state, and, and, and I would tell you, a majority of other districts across the state require their teacher assistants to drive. The teacher assistant pay is actually higher than the pay for uh, their time. The bus driving pay is higher than their, than their TA pay. Uh, so they get paid at a higher rate while they're driving the bus compared to being a TA. And typically what you do is you would take a route and split it between two teacher assistants. One would do the morning route, one would do the afternoon route. And that would either, they're, they're not losing that much time in the school day. All right, so the recommendation is not, is written here, is not correct, because it says, and currently employed teacher assistants. We're not, you're talking <coughs> about new hires starting well, new yeah. hires. Uh, the, the plan way. basically yeah. says that yeah. teacher assistant that currently teacher assistants can apply well, to be a bus driver. Yeah. And then that. it says that next year we would require teacher assistants to meet the bus driving requirement. So mm -hmm. we're not going to make any teacher assistant right now do this. Okay. They, they can if they wish. My second question, and I guess is addressed to Dr. Markley, we have long argued about the importance of teacher assistants, and yet <coughs> now we're talking about cutting them back two hours, although they're going to I mean, be bus drivers. Does that not create a, a, a credibility issue for us on one hand to talk about how important teacher assistants are, and then on the other hand, cut their hours as teacher assistants by two hours? No, because at the end of the day, if I can't get the students to class with those teacher assistants, 
they're not going to get the instruction. I have, a, I have a pipeline issue with, with bus drivers. I have a solution that works for most other districts in the state. I'm simply asking that we take the new funds we're coming on board <coughs> and, and have them do the bus driver training. All right, I would say I have no problem because the last time it's brought to us, y'all were going to mandate that existing teacher assistants. No, it, it, it was the same as this. We weren't going no, to. I don't think so. I, at least <laughs> not the way I understood it. It was going to be, we were going to take teacher assistants and we were going to make them, uh, uh, we wanted, we were going to require those who could pass, I mean, they still got to pass the driving test. They still got to pass the blood pressure. I mean, I could, I don't think I could qualify to drive a bus because I'm blind in one eye. Is that not true? No, sir, you could not. See? But, I mean, my, my point being that I don't have a problem with making it a condition of new of employment, initial employment. I did have a problem with making it a condition of continued <laughs> employment, and I, I am of the opinion that when this came up two years ago, that was the message I was getting. It was going to be a condition of continued employment. If you wanted to stay as a, a TA in this school district, you had to be willing to drive a bus. That I do have a problem with, but I don't have a problem with making it uh, saying to a TA who is being recruited, okay, you're going to be a TA six hours a, a day, but you're going to be expected to drive a bus. I don't have a problem with that. Well, if there is confusion the last time, I apologize for that. The other thing I will say is that when you have TAs well, driving, same thing here. Yeah, when, when you have TAs driving a bus, they're driving a bus for the school that they're working at. I understand. So they've got a knowledge of those students that they're going to see within the day. and. We think that it will also help with discipline issues on buses. All right, here's the other question. Who's going to get the buses over there? Hey, the park there we'll have to look at where we park those buses. There'll okay. be some changes in, in, the, uh, in that I mean, process. Usually they park buses at the schools anyway. Yeah. But, but anyway. A lot of school right. systems do that now. Yeah. Use Brunswick County, Pender County. They park because a lot of their drivers come from the schools. Those buses are parked at those schools. Okay. But now this doesn't, if I'm understanding correctly, that uh, – you would not be giving someone a full-time job that's now part-time. These teacher assistants are full-time now. See, I was thinking possibly whether it be, because as I stated in an email many years ago when I went to Winter Park, our, our bus driver, when we got to school, he then went into school. He was a custodian at the school. Uh, I didn't know if there were enough part-time people who might want a full-time job with benefits and so forth that would do, you know, part, you know, whether it be custodial or, we've, or whatever. We've seen some of that with custodians, and we've seen some of it, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, we've got a couple of your cafeteria folks who, who are driving in order to get them up to full time. Yeah, because I, I would think that would be appealing. Because it's, it's, it's not unheard of, because I know years ago, historically, that I remember some years ago where to teach in this county as a classroom teacher, it was written into your contract that it called upon you would coach. Well, historically, mm -hmm. high school students drove buses. Right. Yeah. When I went to school, that's who drove the buses. We didn't have, I mean, they got paid, but mm -hmm. we did not have. We had them here. Well, yeah, drivers. we didn't have, but we did not have professional, if you will, uh -huh. bus drivers. We had high school students mm -hmm. who could pass the test. I think, what, this DOT or somebody outlawed that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We have had, had student yeah. drivers for over 30 asking. years. Yeah. When I was in high school, well, we didn't have student old. drivers. You did, right? Did not have, oh, we did, did not have high school students driving the bus now. Yeah, with yeah, your part time a lot younger custodians than that you've hired recently, because you have a list constantly each month for us, do you talk with them about the possibility of the dual jobs at that time? We have, and have actually offered that for quite some time. And, it's and not usually we are not, they're more interested in being a full time custodian than a part time custodian and a part time bus driver. Well, it's a tremendous responsibility to drive that bus. Oh, it is. It is. And another thing we need to work on is with working with these parents to understand that the child has to obey the bus rules. Yes, ma'am, that's right. And unfortunately, I, when I ride behind a bus, I see these kids jumping <laughs> up, no matter, up and down and moving no matter what school they're leaving from. So it's not one particular area. But... Um, I like the idea that you are going to give benefits with less with 30 hours a week. Yes, ma'am. That should be a major incentive for 
we, um, we have done that now for several years and we're still just not getting the numbers that we need. It's just, it's now not enough of a draw to bring means, people. It means healthcare, right? That's right. It would be yeah. healthcare, but please keep in mind that that's where the, as Dr. Markley said, the pipeline for these employees has gotten much smaller due to the employment situation. We're competing now with a lot of other places that offer that. And so it's, it's this or that and we're, we're losing. Another point, I came from a county where our TA <coughs> drove the school buses. And there's some other parts of this that sometimes aren't as, as quite as visible. But one is that you, you know where the bus driver is during the day. The bus driver is in your school and, and is a part of the school community. And the bus driver knows the kids that they're going to be driving home. They typically have those kids in the school. And it's really, you'll find in counties where they've done this that their accident rate, the, actually the student incident number and all that sort of thing go down because of that knowledge of the students and, and being that part of the school community. Are, are y'all not worried that a speeding ticket is you know, going to disqualify TA from teaching here in New Hanover County? Are, are we worried about it? Yeah, it just seems a little extreme because if you get a speeding ticket, you're not going to be eligible for a CDL. So we're not going to have people that apply to be a teacher assistant if they have a speeding ticket are not going to be accepted to be a TA. Doesn't that seem fairly extreme if we have a good applicant? It, it depends upon the state and, and the ticket. If it's a ticket, normally we can get that around that. And because we have bus drivers who do get ticketed and will lose their bus driver's license for a period of time. But if there's 11 tickets, then yeah, that's it's, well, yeah, it's I not going to it, happen. And I'm not sure. Uh, again, you'll have to check the, the statutes for me, but I, I think that I, if you have a speeding ticket, maybe greater than 10 miles an hour coming in, you're, you're not going to get your CDL license, a conviction. That's correct. If you, yeah. if you get a speeding ticket, uh, Above 10. You, you'll lose it's your license. 10 or below, right. So but, we're going to have. As you know, a lot of good lawyers can take care no, of that. No, no, I understand <laughs> that, but then there's also a lot of people that don't know yeah. that, that, that come in there and plead guilty to, to a plus 10 and, and we're not able to get a TA and they're going to go somewhere else. I understand. But I've, our applicant pools for TAs is a large applicant pool. That's when you're looking at the, the pool, there's a, usually a large deep quality pool for those. Now, for some areas like special ed where you have specific skill set that's more important than bus driving, we'd have to look at those. Is that why the, the only uh, teacher assistants are the only ones listed here that for the 18, 19 school year that we, they would be required? We wouldn't do the same thing with custodians or any other group in our school? Would that I would door? personally be happy to tell everyone who's coming on board into a custodial or, or a position that they should get bus driver training. Well, when uh, they did the thing about coaching, it was in every teacher's contract. Well, we've already talking. discussed cafeteria workers. We already handled that last year, right? Well, the proposal was not approved last year, but we went to our cafeteria workers and have recruited some of them to bus drivers. There's, it's not mandated they go through bus driver training. What about um, right now in this dire need for drivers, are we using anyone in the schools that have their license, like the coaches or assistant coaches or special teachers that may not have a duty? You see a lot of those folks in the schools who have CDLs, they're <coughs> driving some of the field trips. Uh, and Ken will tell you, we struggle to fill field trip uh, bus drivers sometimes. We've actually canceled one or two trips because we couldn't find a bus driver to Take, <coughs> take the students on that trip. So that's where you see a lot of the folks in the school, if they have that driver's, that license, helping out in that capacity. But if I do that with a the teacher, then sometimes I'm having to find a sub to cover the right, teacher's class. Yeah, and the class comes first, I understand that. Mr. Nance, so many bus drivers, how many buses are actively running? 158. And how many bus drivers do you need to operate 158 buses? 158. Okay. So how many do you have currently employed? I'm short 10 driver positions, plus I'm short seven drivers out long term. So tomorrow I'll be short 17 when we start the day. Now we'll, so have, we'll have a few subs come in, we'll double up runs, and then we'll use our, our staff to make up the difference. This is for information only tonight? Correct. It'll be on for action next month. Now, and we would not be here tonight, but we've done everything. We've, we've, at the start of the school year, we talked to uh, Guilford County, Forsyth County, um, Charlotte Meck, um, Bladen County, um, 
Brunswick, Pender, to see what they were doing. We've done everything they're doing. Um, in the last 10 years, we've gone from 55% of our employees having full-time benefits to over 80% of them having full-time benefits. Like Dr. Wilmer said, uh, we gave, or the state legislature gave them about a 7% raise this year, but that just doesn't change the fact that we can't find people who can pass the test. We had out of the class, I think there were 32 in the class this last time, I think. So far, we've got two of them that passed all the requirements to be a bus driver out of 32. Okay. It, what, yeah. what part what part peels them off the most probably the written test but then when they go uh, some of them the physical gets them too when it comes to either diabetes or or because um, again the DOT medical card is a new addition starting January 1st before it was more of a generic kind of physical that was given but now uh, the DOT medical card is much more specific as to as to certain requirements uh, but I'd say that probably the written test is the hardest part of the whole thing. Would there not be ADA issues if you were to deny someone because they couldn't get their CDL because of a medical issue? No. How many TAs do we have currently? Um, total about 250 that would be eligible for this, 400 total because we back out EC and, and the special TAs, Title I that we may not use. So we look at an average of around 240 that would that we think could work into this program. John, typically in a given year, how many TAs do we hire? Anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, in a normal year. So that, that's potential over I, the course of three I years. Have no, I have no problem making a condition for new hires. <clears throat> I well, just I, I still stand that I am not going to mandate that somebody that's already working is going to be told they have to be a bus driver if they can qualify. And, and we're not, if, if we have enough drivers, we won't even ask the TAs to drive, okay? I and we'll, we'll pay all the costs and everything. We just, because we looked at other counties and what they were doing, and that is one of the th ways they are meeting some of their demands is using TAs. Like I said, if you check with Bladen, uh, Cumberland, people all around us, Pender, Brunswick, that's how they meet part of, the, part of their demand. And they still have problems just like we do. If you go to Cumberland County, almost all their drivers, with the exception of EC, are either child nutrition, janitorial, or TAs. That's who drives almost all their buses. The one place they have trouble finding drivers is EC because they don't use school staff to drive <coughs> EC buses. They use specific drivers for those buses. But again, we're just trying to look for an opportunity to, to, that we can take advantage of to maybe improve our pool of drivers because I get phone calls, and you do too, from parents why is the bus late? I don't understand why the bus is late. And it's kind of hard to tell them, I just can't find drivers, because that's not a good excuse to most parents. What when kind of recruitment are we doing road. to S sir? TA? What kind of recru recruitment are we doing for TAs, cafeteria workers, and janitorial staff to make them aware of, of what you have been telling us today? I mean, I, I, I sense one of two things. Number one, if you don't have <coughs> any TAs driving, then obviously we were right when we said we shouldn't mandate that somebody's hired as a TA be made to be a bus driver. But on the other hand, you have had TAs and, and cafeteria people, but I just wonder, are we going out, are we recruiting them and saying to them, or are we just assuming that they know that, hey, you could be a bus driver if they don't live on Carolina Beach Road, they don't see the bus with a sign out front. Well, I'll give you an example. In the beginning, Head Start was going to drive their own buses, OK? OK. And that was going to be a requirement. And several of them got their CDL. The moment they were told they didn't have to drive a bus, they stopped driving a bus. OK. Well, I mean, I, uh, but again, I would say if you make a condition of employment initially, I don't have a problem with it. And let me explain to the board, too, very briefly, that one of the, the caveats in this that is causing our TAs not to currently do this is the way that we pay support staff and TAs. Uh, what we would have to do with this, and it's included in the proposal, is move to a biweekly pay, which changes what we're doing. Um, and in the long run, I think would be beneficial, but would cause a, would, would, we would have to take some steps to protect our current employees as we made that change. <coughs> but that's one of the caveats in this that you need to be aware of. We do need to change the pay scale or the way we pay, wouldn't be the pay scale, the way we pay um, support staff in these positions. It would pay be for schedule. everybody. The pay schedule 
Uh, no, it would act, yes, ma'am, the pay schedule. What is the average TA, the difference if they drive a bus, how much money is it? Uh, would it what would it be? I am not sure. If it's zero, I would drive, um, it would be a dollar difference more in the driver. The gas will about 10 to 15, it's mm -hmm. about $2 more an hour. Okay. And then they kind of level out at about 10 to 20. <clears throat> One thing out of curiosity, I know some states, I think South Carolina is one, one of the closer ones, and this is a state issue, we couldn't do anything about it, but I'm just wondering as a comparison, uh, were they allowed, they're a private, they, they privatize just like we do any other, you know, custodial, <coughs> cafeteria, or whatever, they privatize their transportation systems. Do, do they have the same problems, do you think? Yes, private companies have the same problem. If you look at, we get normal, I mean, but I read an article today, um, I can't remember what state it was, but the private as well as the public all have the same problem. It, it's, a, it's a common problem throughout the United States. I get magazines that are bus transportation related, mm -hmm. and I don't care if it's a private company or, or the public who runs it, it's the same problem. Uh, it's just a very difficult time to be able to, to uh, find bus drivers. And it, I've been here 10 years, and it was somewhat difficult when we first came here. It's just gotten harder and harder and harder as the years progress. Do, do you think behavior on the bus has anything to do with the person's desire to drive a bus or not to drive a bus? It probably has something to do with it, yes, sir. Yeah, I think so. I'm sure it, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're trying to drive a bus with 60 kids and some of them are not mm -hmm. behaving on the back of the bus, it makes it difficult. Particularly in a town as, as, uh, with as much traffic as we have here. But the other thing is, being a bus driver has gotten harder. Like I said earlier, the testing has gotten harder, and the and the medical requirements have gotten harder. It's just a, you you narrow you've narrowed your your pool of people who can actually be a bus driver from what it was ten years ago or five years ago. And that's all been driven by the state. I have a question. Um, in this write up, it's talking about uh, uh, Dr. Wilmer's a five day a week, six hour becoming a five day a week, eight hour. So you're going <coughs> 30 to 40 hours a week and 40 hours a week would be uh, full time and benefits would be provided, right? At the 30 and above, the benefits would be provided. Okay, so if you're at 30 hours now, you get the same benefits as a 40 hour? Yes, sir. Prorated. No, prorated, I mean, well, for the percentage. I just want to add, I just want to clarify, it. TAs are all 40-hour employees right now. We don't have any part-time TAs. Mm -hmm. We have, we have part-time bus drivers that are 30 hours with benefits. So the reason we have to reduce the TAs or the new hires to six hours is to give them time to drive the bus when not earning overtime. Right. So, so part of this proposal is to reduce sort of the standard TA hours for the new positions to six to give them room for the for that, um, for the, the bus driver job at the higher rate. So there's some loss of, <coughs> some loss of TA exposure in the classroom with this proposal. That's right. There, there is, but you're, you're going to have, we could still look at the overall need. You're going to be spending less TA funding um, and because and, uh, the differential is paid out of bus funding. You could, if, you, if the board de determined they wanted to, you could add more TA positions. Um, so that's, that's also part of what you can look at because the TA funding will remain the same unless you de decided to reduce the budget. And Dr. Markley, what are you hearing about the, um, uh, from the principals, the need for more TAs? What do you hear there? I think our principals will always tell you that they could use more teacher assistance. So what, when, you, when you think of the funding, it's an 80-20 split basically. Right. So you're gaining 20% of your TA funding back that you could use to expand that pool. So if that were the case, if you went down that path, how many more TAs could you buy <coughs> or hire with that 20%? Well, one I basically would gain one for every five that was a bus driver. Yeah. And you have how many now? Probably 250 that would be impacted by this. So, But it's just through attrition, right. so it's not gonna be an automatic. Right. Would happen no, I, I got it, yeah, I'm with it. I'm just trying to understand. Typical, <coughs> typical year we're hiring 20 to 30 TAs. So if 20 of them become bus drivers, that gives you an extra 20% number to, that's another four TAs that we're looking at that we could, we could gain. And the write-up in here, 
as Mr. Higgins said, the teacher assistant will be working, I think it would be would be working if they chose to, it would be conditional upon them choosing to. I'm talking about existing TAs. Yeah, existing TAs would, uh, is a, always will give them the option. Okay. Uh, so instead of would, it would be could. Could, yes. All right, so at this point, this is information. It'll be back next month. If you have additional questions, please do not hesitate to call any of us and we'll try to provide information. Or if you want something that us to have additional information for February's board meeting, but, we'll bring it back. But would there be any more information forthcoming about start times, some adjustments there that might make this unnecessary? Or is that possible? I was under the impression that in something we received that that would be a possibility. Are you saying, Brunswick Don, County, that Didn't Brunswick County do that and for about a half an hour, then they switch back. Uh, yeah, they're on, they're on a two. Brunswick uh, County's on two two, yeah. like we yeah. are. I want to make sure I've got yeah. this right. Instead of instead of would, it will be could. No, <laughs> for, I, I guess what Mr. Shell and I were talking about was that would we have some more information coming forward on that that might make this unnecessary, or is that practical? A staggering of start times, because I know Brunswick County did something, but I think if people understood, I, I know that would well, be unpopular. They went on a three route deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be unpopular, but if they understood what the problems are, I think it would be uh, better yeah. understood. The, the biggest issue you have of going to um, three runs instead of two is the change in times. You have pretty significant change in times as to when school starts and stops and so forth. I don't. I know Charlotte Mecklenburg, I think they start <laughs> high schools at 715 uh, and get out, I think, at 215. And they've got some, I don't remember the, the middle school and the. Yeah, it's, it's staggered times, but s schools start a little bit earlier and definitely end late. They start earlier in, in, the, in the, whichever one you decide to start first, either elementary or high school, and then the other one starts much later and ends much later, okay? Right. Yeah, but so, you have to. And that's yeah. the issue I think you have to face is how parents would receive the change in the times. You saw what happened at <coughs> Coddington. Mm hmm. Mr. Yeah. Nance, did, you didn't mention Wake County. Have you talked with them as well? Yes, sir. I, 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 that's one of the ones I surveyed was Wake County. I, okay. uh, I guess I forgot about them. Like I said, it was Wake, Guilford, Forsyth, Cumberland, Run, Brunswick, Pender, and maybe one more. I can't remember off the top of my head. But those are the ones I surveyed this past summer before school started because we were starting out short. And, of course, they, oh, Charlotte and Mac also. Uh, and they were all had the same problem. Everybody was short drivers and desperately trying to figure out how they can get kids to and from school. Is the, uh, the, at the DOT level, is the exam that they give, are the requirements reasonable? Or you just, the, you're having a hard time getting people to fit that criteria? I'm having a hard time for people to study well enough to pass the test. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's one of these things that, um, I think most people should be able to pass the test if they study to take it. We have a lot of people go to the class thinking it's kind of like getting your driver's license, <coughs> and it's not. There are a lot, a lot of very detailed questions in there that you have to have knowledge about, and that's the reason a lot of people don't don't pass. I don't know if it's because they just it's not that important to them, or they don't take the time to study to take the test. But when we have, and they can take it three times, the test three times after going through the class. Okay. And we'll have a 20% passage rate, maybe, the first time around. And when it's all said and done, we're lucky if we get 40% who actually pass the test after three times. So would it behoove us along the lines of what Ms. Kavanaugh was talking about <laughs> to have a separate tutoring uh, of some of those folks to help them be successful? I'm talking about beyond what DOT does. <coughs> I guess it may change things. I can't answer that because I don't know. We've never tried it. It'll be a repeat of the same stuff she teaches. Um, but the lady that teaches for us, uh, teaches for the state, we can certainly try that, okay? Uh, but um, I don't think it'll harm it. And the reason I was thinking about it is, like for my appraisal courses, I took the necessary requirements to pass it but I then went on and took a refresher course or a tutorial session or however you want to describe it where it really hammered through the things that were most necessary on the test. 
and it helped me a great deal <coughs> versus if I had not gone to it and just gone with the regular training. Well, we can certainly try. I guess the issue you run into is how many people want to go to class three days with the state and then three days with us also with this repeating well, of the same material. I'm hearing, though, it doesn't have to be a three-day test. No. On the day before the test, we could do a, right. a, a, a test prep session. Right. Yeah. We could do that. And, and quite frankly, I think it would help a great deal it, because you know going in, if you're experienced, you know what they're going to hit you on. Of course, there are going to be those stray questions and answers here and there, but as far as the meat of the course, you know what that is. Yeah, we, we can certainly try that because, like I said, we're doing three days and a break within the study, then the test is on the fourth day. We can certainly offer for those who want to come back for refresher on that day in between. If they want the job bad enough and we want them to have it bad enough, I, I think that we will find a way to make it work. We'll, we'll certainly try that going forward in our next class. Mr. Nance, in those counties that you surveyed that went to the um, requiring new TAs to, uh, to drive, what has the response been from the TAs? Did you ask that? I, I don't know, to be honest in a, with you. In a lot of those cases, it's not a new policy. It's been their policy <coughs> for, for decades. Yeah. I mean, okay, if you go to so no one has, yeah, has you go to those other counties, they've been doing this for years. It's not a recent thing. So, I, I guess they're used to it by now. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, being a bus driver is a hard job. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if I had a, I'm not trying to say being a TA is an easy job. If I had a job between being a TA and being a bus driver, I pick TA every day. Because I, I watch the video of, of what these drivers have to do every day. And uh, it's, not, it's not just um, his parents at bus stops. It's the traffic. <clears throat> it's, it's not just the students. It's all those things put together. There's a lot of pressure on bus drivers each and every day as they do their job. And they do a great job. You have to see what they did every day. Well, I think the point is it's a different skill set. And that's why TAs are so resistant mm -hmm. to doing that job. They're, they are aptitude and more of a nurturing nature is to do what that they do. And uh, I think you, I agree with you. I think it's a very different, uh, a very different skill set. Dr. Markley, can you make sure that this is represented to us with the correct verbs sometime in the next week or so, so that we'll be ready for the next meeting? Yes, ma'am. The, the woulds and the shoulds and the cans and the well, mays and... Don't have any shalls in there, Dr. Markley. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to capitalize those shalls, too, as we go through this. So and they'll, and they'll one last, <clears throat> me, for clarification, um, I understand proposal for future TAs. Mm -hmm. What about, do, do, do we include uh, cafeteria folks in that? I mean, if we've got some part-time folks that might I would, want to. I, I thought be, we already did cafeteria last year, or it, oh, came, no, we, it no. came to us, but we didn't do it. Offered it to them, and so yeah. we took it, but we do not mandate it. I would be, yeah, I'm happy to include uh, our cafeteria folks in there. Now, Imer will tell you there's a cost that goes with that because if they're part-time for Imer, remember she's an enterprise fund in child nutrition. So when they, if, once they become full-time employees, her costs go up for the child nutrition portion of that in terms of the benefit piece. So we'll have to fund, uh, we'll have to fund it. Now she'll have to fund it out of child nutrition. Yeah, but I suspect, I mean, the expectation is going to be that we're going to have to fund it or reimburse her or whatever because I can't expect her to fund it to enhance what we're doing. We were looking at part of transportation funding to offset yeah. some of that if, if it went into child nutrition. Let me ask one other question, and I think well, the let, I think before you go on, let Mary, she's dying to okay, talk yes, on that particular. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just add that um, the state does require that we, when you have a shared position, that you have to properly um, code transportation <coughs> expenses to, tran to transportation and child nutrition child nutrition whether or not you wanted to add additional child nutrition funding out of local you know that's a decision you could make but you can't call it transportation so we we would have to to prorate those and in any overtime and benefits accordingly okay. and I think we would have to probably wait a year to see what the actual impacts are before we we, we make those kinds of adjustments all right 
Assuming you come back with the exact same wording, the last paragraph, in addition, all teacher assistants hired starting in 2018-19 must hold a North Carolina commercial driver's license with passenger and school bus endorsement or show evidence of enrollment. What if they can't qualify for it? Does that mean we don't hire them? That's what he mm -hmm. said. Yeah. That's we would not hire reads. a teacher assistant because they can't drive a bus. If they can't pass the test, I don't know that you That was Mr. Workman's point earlier. Well, but what about, what if I wanted to, what if after I left the board, I wanted to be a teacher assistant? I'm saying if you can't pass the written test, I, I, I don't think you would. We, even even though I could make an adequate teacher assistant, you would deny me because I can't get a, C, a CDL. No, I'm saying if you can't pass the written test and you can't learn that That's much. That's not what it says here. I'm just saying. Uh, That's my problem. People who lack, who would fail it because of okay. health or disability. But that's one thing, but the academic part. But that doesn't part, say that here. No, but the so academic part, That's what I'm saying, part, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It needs that's to be clear to that a teacher assistant does, should not have yeah, to have not. It's it's a up. CDL, but it, in order to be hired, they have to agree to get a CDL if they can qualify. Mr. Buller, do you see a problem from a discrimination standpoint? Well, the, the only thing would be you, if you had someone with a vision problem that couldn't get a CDL but was qualified to be a teaching assistant, you'd have to make a reasonable accommodation by waiving the requirement for that person. Otherwise, it could run afoul of the Americans mm -hmm. with Disabilities Act yeah. in that particular situation. I'm just saying. But as a general condition of employment, <clears throat> the ability to drive a bus for a, this new for teacher, t teacher assistant slash bus driver, that's not an unreasonable burden. Well, I'm just, uh, before we pass this, I just want to make sure all of that is clarified because I don't want to pass something and then He's going to have it to us with all the... You think so? Well, that's what he said. No, he said he was going to change that one verb for you. No, I said, are you going to change all of it to the woods and the coulds and the... Sh and he said, well, yes, he was going to change it. Currently. Yeah, we anyway, will. Anyway, we, we okay. will clean the language up. We'll have Wayne give us the the, the legal stamp of approval. Yeah. I think you could put it put an exception in there for the situation I described, and otherwise, <laughs> it, I think it would pass legal muster. You know, if you, I think if you just say if you can't qualify by not passing the test, people can decide not to pass the test. They don't want to be a bus driver. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, and of course, Wayne, you can correct me on this. Maybe you could just say. They have to pass a written test, a driving test, if they don't qualify because of medical reasons, and yet they're qualified to be a TA. In that case, you could still possibly hire well, them. Something to protect them. It's not just a blanket right. statement. Mm -hmm. we, all, we currently require coaches to become to get their bus driving licenses so they can drive buses. Well, do we fire coaches if uh, don't not hire coaches if <laughs> they can't get it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, they I drive have a question for Iris. Would you mind going up there? That could be a problem someday. Okay. Can we look at the wording that we have for the yes. coaches? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, how many cafeteria workers uh, do you not recall how many we have? As bus drivers, <coughs> we have no, no, not how many. many. We have in total? Oh, um, oh, total. Total just bus drivers. Cafeteria workers. Dual, empl dual, dual employees. Oh, just cafeteria. Um, Two thirty. 230, and how many of those would you guess are drivers? Oh, maybe four or five. Okay, so. Um, and then I have custodians too. And I, I, and I think Mary Hazel and Dr. Wilmers and, and uh, Dr. Markley have, uh, have said there's a cost, but sure. my guess my, to you, and certainly as Mr. Higgins said, we would have to be prepared to make you whole, but my, I guess my uh, question out of all those folks, and you've got four or five that are doing that now, if they could go to full time and receive the full time benefits rather than a prorated benefits, uh, do you think there would be any receptivity on <coughs> that end? I think, you know, if I, I, I do, um, if I do find out that an employee, a part-time employee is interested in full-time position, but they don't have um, 
what's needed to go into my full-time positions, I do encourage them to seek out transportation or maintenance with custodials um, services to, you know, get the full-time benefits. And then we evaluate, you know, uh, what, looking at their hours, we try to evaluate to make sure that it's going to work for me in the school, if, you know, and then also for the other departments. So we do, yeah. So it is something, you know, I do, I don't, um, I do encourage, um, I can't make them, but I do encourage them. Of course them. not, but, but uh, we, we talk about how we have tried to get bus drivers, but yet we've not expanded the offer at that level at, it, yet. I mean, the four or five that have, are driving sought it out on their own and said, yeah, I'd like to drive. <coughs> So I guess that's my point, is I, I think that's another effort that we know We, now we notified take. all of the child nutrition workers that they could do this. Yeah. We've gone through that with, with all the support employees that could possibly do this, so they know. We try to make that a, an emphasis. And I know that Eddie's folks have done that a whole lot. Okay. Okay. Have we beat this horse enough? Yeah, <laughs> no, I think so. It's dead. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, anybody have any Thank other you. questions? I'm going to ask. I might not should. All right, if not, then next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report <clears throat> make up days due to the inclement weather. Yeah, okay. In case you didn't know, we had a, a snowstorm and an really? ice storm. <laughs> <laughs> and we missed know, a couple did, of days. Did you know that seven, days, cool down, seven days out this, this week? was the first time that had happened since 1918. Mm -hmm. It's been 100 years since we've had that many. Yeah, and in a place known for hurricanes, I've had more snow days than hurricane days. We weren't around in 1918 like you were. Right. <laughs> I realize that. I look good for my age. All right, guys, let me get. <laughs> All right, you see uh, in front of you the list of days that were missed. In the old days, we would make up day for day, but now we look at hours. And so we actually will make up, my proposal is to make up three of the days because we have enough hours to cover that. Okay. There are issues between 10 month and 12 month employees. With 10 month employees, we can add work days at the end to make those days up for them. But for 12 month employees, the state tells us, I've got to charge them for that day they were out. And if you remember, I think there's a recent uh, article about the at UNCW that was on that. Or offer them makeups or some way to make those days up. So that's why you see a difference in the 10 month and 12 month there, giving those folks opportunities <coughs> to potentially make those days up so they wouldn't have to use leave. So let me run through these. How many, before we start, how many days does the state require children to be in school? It's not days anymore, it's hours. Hours, how many hours? Sorry. Is it 10, nine, is it 1080? 1050. What? Which roughly translates into 180 days. 185. Right. That's, I mean, you can actually miss a day. You can probably miss two days okay. and, and be okay on the hours, but my concern is we're only in January. That's fine. I just want yep. everyone to be aware that that's why it's happening. Correct. All right, so on for 1-3, we would, we would eliminate the work day that was scheduled for Friday, January 26th. Uh, uh, on the day that we missed on 1-4, Tuesday, May 8th, that is primary day, and the reason we were closed was because of primaries, but we have held elections with school open in the past, and primaries generally don't garner what a general election does in terms of traffic in the building. Uh, on 1-5, we were scheduled to end the year on a Thursday. We would now end it on a Friday, June 8th, and then we would not make up 1-8 we have enough, because of the hours requirement. For 10 month employees, you can see we would add the optional work days. For 12 months, we would give them some flexible to make up. We would open our buildings for uh, on Saturday, the January 13th. That's the Saturday before Martin Luther King Day. We start our work day pay periods on Saturdays. So it would only be a 40 hour week for them be with that Saturday because of the holiday. So there wouldn't be any additional time and a half uh, issues there for, for payroll folks. And then Memorial Day would be an optional work day. They could either take the leave or, or not on that day. It would not be a student day though. Okay. How is that June 8th day gonna work with 
final exams for seniors would that just be the makeup day it would be anyway? the it's currently a the last day of the year scheduled to be a half day that becomes the half day okay so that actually gained an extra day for exams okay <clears throat> All right, I noticed that this Saturday is this Saturday. Correct. So do we need to take any action? or? Do you yes, you need to approve this. Okay. All right, you have seen the superintendent's recommendation. Do I hear a motion? And is this just it? traditional? Tr yes, the, uh, the year rounds lost one day, so only, they only lost one day, so we wouldn't do anything school-wise for them, but there are some employee implications, and I'll let Mary Hazel talk about those. <laughs> For year round because they, they lost the work they didn't lose. I know that, but I thought you needed a motion before well, you did, I did that. Well, I did initially, but I'm letting her make a presentation. Excuse me. Okay. Um, for year round, they lost last week. Friday was a work day. The first two days were intercession days. So they would still, that holiday, makeup day, would sort of solve the problem for, for them. The one from um, where we're moving Memorial Day holiday technically to last Friday. So they would be good. Early college is in traditional. Uh, excuse me, in traditional pre-K on the second page, if we go down to the bottom, there's another chart. Just because they have different calendars, we essentially did the same thing, but their work days that we're taking for students are on different days, you know, as well as the days that they end the year are different. So the same concept, just different dates, and those are listed on page two for yeah, each of the calendars. If we had some calendar flexibility, I would have more room to do things at the end of the year. Good old days. But literally that Friday, is the is the only extra day I could pick up at the end of the year. But but if you have Except some schools now, and I don't, I can't keep all these calendars straight. Yeah, I'm Memorial visually day. oriented. I'd have to have them laying out here. But my question is, if you, a lot of these different schedules have half days. Uh, I assume on these days that we're adding, those would be days that they normally would not have been there, which is going to be an additional expense <coughs> of running buses and bringing them there that day. Why couldn't we We didn't take have the expense of running the buses the days they weren't in school. Well, okay, yeah, but I'm going to save us even more. Uh, if we've got a Friday where they're going to be there half day, why couldn't we just make that a whole day because they're going to be there anyway and, and pick up a half a day there? So It'll help you, two or three it would help like you that. a little bit on the hours. When we do a half day, it's really a two-hour release, so you're only gaining two hours for the students. It doesn't really help you with making up the days, though, for the adults in, in that building. Plus, some of those half days are already scheduled professional development days, and we would you would lose. So then I would so then I'd lose that professional development, and a lot of that's been pre-scheduled. I just thought I'd throw it yeah. out in that okay. since they're already there, just extend their day to, to eliminate the the additional transportation. Good thought. Good thought. Can yeah. we just make a note to also add talk about this at the legislative breakfast again? Yes, one more year. Every year? Seven years I've been doing this. Seven hmm. years we've had it on the agenda. Like I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is approved. I would like just one last thing. Folks, our maintenance folks did yeoman's work during this vacation. Oh, yes. Absolutely. We lost. We had, we had a water uh, pipe break at uh, <coughs> Mary C. Williams. They went in. They got one of the buildings back up and able to run today. We had a sprinkler <coughs> break at Forest Hills. They were out there at night taking care of that. We had some issues at Laney. Uh, we don't give those guys enough credit in terms of what they do, the maintenance folks, the custodian folks. Ken's folks were on the road this weekend checking roads to see if we could get the buses out there. There's a lot of folks who do a lot of great work behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. All right. Next item, consensus item, personnel, Appendix G, Dr. Wellmush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Request the board approve the personnel matters as presented. So moved. Second. Anything of any significance, Dr. Wellmush? I don't believe so, no, sir. <laughs> you got a motion and a second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, it's been suggested because it might take a while on the redistricting that we take five. <laughs> So Is that a five-minute five. break? Yes, it's yeah. a real five-minute break. Set the timer up here. Let's set the timer. 